Uh, so our next speaker is Angela Lucas-Herald from uh, Glasgow. She's a clinical research fellow, and she's going to talk about altered vascular function in boys with hyperspadius, role of reactive oxygen species. Angela. Um, so good afternoon, and thank you to the organisers for the opportunity to present this data today, looking at the vascular function of boys with hyperspadius. Now, the masculinisation programming window takes place between around week 6 to 20 in utero. During this time, there should be a surge of testosterone for normal male sexual development to occur. If this doesn't happen, then conditions such as hypospadias can develop. Hypospadias occurs in around 1 in 300 live births. You can see that it can vary in severity from the more severe proximal cases to milder distal cases. And treatment generally consists of surgical reconstruction and then review by paediatric endocrine services. Now, we know that in adult men, low testosterone, or hypogonadism, is associated with adverse cardiovascular outcomes. And we know that if we treat these men with testosterone, then that improves survival. What we don't know, however, is what impact a low testosterone in utero might have on the function of paediatric blood vessels. Our aims were therefore to determine if there were differences in vascular reactivity in the genital skin blood vessels from boys with hypospadias and controls, and also what effect testosterone might have. Our overall hypothesis was that boys with hypospadias would exhibit vascular dysfunction through altered androgen signaling, which would be improved by testosterone therapy. To do the study, we got ethical approval to take excess subcutaneous <laughs> tissue from boys who were undergoing hypospadias repair, as our cases, and boys undergoing circumcision as our controls. From these, we dissected out resistance arteries, and we did wire myography studies to look at vasoconstriction and vasodilatation. We also harvested vascular smooth muscle cells, and in the interest of time today, I'm just going to talk about our experiments looking at reactive oxygen species generation. To date, we have had 20 boys with hypospadias and 29 controls in the study. You can see their median age at time of surgery was just under two years. But otherwise, their clinical parameters, including heart rate, blood pressure, blood profile, and hormone profile, were similar on the day of surgery. Now, for, for my subsequent slides, you'll see that the results from the blood vessels from the boys with hypospadias are shown in red, and those for the controls are shown in blue. Now, this is a vasoconstriction curve in response to U46619, which is a thromboxane A2 receptor analogue. And you can see that the boys with hypospadias have a marked increase in vasoconstriction compared to the controls. We thought a lot about mechanisms for this, and we know from animal models that testosterone can influence reactive oxygen species generation. We therefore looked at this using Amplex Red and Lucigenin enhanced chemiluminescence techniques, and you can see a significant increase in ROS generation in the, ves in the vascular smooth muscle cells from our boys with hypospadias. We then wanted to see what would happen in the blood vessels. So we introduced n cysteine as a raw scavenger. You can see that there's very little difference in terms of the vasoconstriction seen in our controls, with, sorry, without and then with NAC. However, when we added n cysteine to the vessels from our boys with hypospadias, this increased vasoconstriction is reduced down to the level of a control. We then wondered what the effects of testosterone might be. So we introduced this to our blood vessels. You can see that in our control, testosterone, as shown by the dotted line, increases vasoconstriction, with no effect on the vessels from our boys with hypospadias. We wondered if what we had seen in the controls was also because of ROS. And sure enough, when you introduce testosterone with ROS, with n cysteine as a ROS scavenger, you see a significant reduction in that vasoconstriction. Again, there's no difference in our boys with hypospadias. Finally, we wondered about vasorelaxation, and we looked at this by looking at endothelium-dependent vasorelaxation with acetylcholine and endothelium-independent vasorelaxation with sodium nitroprusside. And again, you can see a significant reduction in vasorelaxation in the blood vessels from our boys with hypospadias compared to controls. When we treated the blood vessels with testosterone, that markedly improved our vasorelaxation in the boys with hypospadias, but there was no improvement in our controls. So to conclude, this is actually the first study to date examining paediatric subcutaneous resistance arteries in this way. We've demonstrated that resistance arteries from boys with hypospadias are dysfunctional and that this dysfunction appears to be ROS dependent. We've shown that testosterone improves vasorelaxation in boys with hypospadias but has no impact on vasoconstriction. What's clear from this data is there's a need to investigate this vascular dysfunction 
in the mice with hypospadias in terms of long-term outcome studies. And this is something that we're undergoing just now. I'm very grateful to their patients and their families for taking part, to all of my collaborators, and to the British Heart Foundation for funding this work. Thank you. Questions, Mandy. That was a lovely presentation. Could I ask you, did you, in your myography experiments, did you look at the effects of testosterone on its own? And have you looked at dihydroxytestosterone, which is, seems to be more vasoreactive than testosterone on its own, and testosterone metabolism may well play some role in this? Um, so we have actually looked at the results with testosterone, dihydrotestosterone, also with estrogen. Um, all of which seem to result in a pro-contractile um, phenotype in our constriction curves. There doesn't actually seem to be the same impact with DHT on vasorelaxation that we see with the testosterone, which I think is quite interesting, because that should be more potent. Um, but in oestrogen, we do see a difference again in the vasorelaxation. We still have smaller numbers with these, so we're trying to increase our end number, but so far the data is interesting. David? Up here, yeah. Well done. Those look jolly difficult experiments. Two, two things. One is, um, are the vessels that you take out and you experiment, are they sort of morphologically the same? Same vessel, all thickness, same diameters, and so on and so forth. And I may have missed it. Are there known cardiovascular consequences of a hyperspadial population when you follow them that might track with microvascular dysfunction? Um, so in relation to your first question, we do see differences in how the vessels look when we're dissecting them. Um, although the samples are from the same place, you do get a difference. Um, we are doing some uh, histology to look at that in more detail, which we don't have the data for yet. Um, but certainly the boys with hypospadias have much, much smaller vessels, making it much harder to do these experiments on them. In terms of long-term outcome studies, um, to date, generally, the boys with hyperspadias actually get discharged um, from around the adolescent period and not followed up, particularly from a cardiovascular point of view. Because of this work, though, we've started looking at doing some data linkage, and we have funding now to look at that for all of Scotland, so that's 30,000 men with hyperspadias. We've done a small study looking at it in one centre in Glasgow. Unfortunately, we don't have data for hypertension, which is what we would be really interested in. But the, what we've seen is that the men who were born with hypospadias had an 11 times increased risk of myocardial infarction and a nine times increased risk of heart failure. So there seems to be something there that actually no one's looked at before. As part of my PhD, we're also looking at um, the cardiovascular effects in adolescents. So we're getting boys who are teenagers to come in to look at their endothelial function as well. So hopefully by the end of my PhD, we'll have a bit of information for adults, for the babies and for adolescents to be able to answer that question. Any more questions? Yes, Anna. <laughs> it's coming. So, so very, very interesting. Yeah, very, very interesting. Um, what is your immediate thinking about potential clinical implication? Because obviously, very difficult to give testosterone to very young children. So, apart from prognostication and everything we've just heard, is there anything else that can be done to prevent things according to your data? Um, well, as I say, for, as, from a paediatric endocrine point of view, I think we're terrible at even just checking things like blood pressure in these boys. So I think the initial step will be risk stratification, looking at blood pressures and things like that. As you say, we wouldn't want to give testosterone routinely to these boys. Some of them we have to so that they can go through puberty. Um, but obviously there's lots of risks involved with testosterone. If you have too much or too little, it's very dangerous. Um, we are looking at using, um, we've done some experiments using letrozole and things like that. And actually, some of the data I found seems to suggest that a lot of the dysfunction we're finding seems to be estrogen related. So maybe actually we need to ignore the androgens and look more at the estrogen side for these boys. Great. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you.